Unable to have children, a bitter invalid, England's second queen died in 1558, 42 years old, the most detested ruler in all England's history. There were celebrations almost as fervent as had greeted her arrival five years before. Her sister Elizabeth came to sit in that terrible seat and be crowned by the grace of God, Queen of England, France and Ireland, defender of the faith and supreme head of the Church of England and Ireland, even though there was not a single yard of French soil actually ruled by England. Calais, England's last little piece of France, had been lost just before Mary's death. England had become an island, and its queen would have to be an island too. She couldn't marry because that would create a king who would be either a foreigner like Philip or an opportunist courtier who'd come trailing faction and enemies in his wake. She would be both queen and king, the virgin queen ruling from a tyrant's throne over a people whose support was essential. Monarchy in England was a paradox, and Elizabeth's solution to the paradox was wholly bizarre. The Tudor monarchy had been shaped by the need to create a line of valid, legitimate male successors. That had not materialised, and now Elizabeth would choose to have no child at all. How would the crown survive? Elizabeth succeeded to the throne when she was 25 years old. By that age, women were generally married with children, but Elizabeth had never had any intention of doing that. Her father had killed her mother. His behaviour towards his other wives had been equally dreadful. At 14, Elizabeth had announced that she would never marry. In fact, her survival through Mary's reign had depended on her being free of any association with anyone else. The slightest hint of her involvement with other people could have made her seem to be connected with plots against Mary and would have led to her execution. She stayed mute giving no sign of a religious, political, or emotional attachment that might destroy her. By the time she came to the throne, the persecutions of her predecessors had left it a stark and lonely place. Nine bishoprics were vacant, there was only one duke left alive, and the treasury was empty. She had no close relatives left alive. The heir to the throne was her aunt's granddaughter, Mary, Queen of Scots, a Roman Catholic. No one knew whether Elizabeth was a Roman Catholic or a Protestant. The first test came over the oath of allegiance. Elizabeth insisted that, like her father, people must acknowledge her as head of the church. The bishops, Roman Catholics appointed by Mary, said that in that case none of them would allow her a coronation. Well, all except for the Bishop of Carlisle. He did the honours and the popular acclamation for the new queen was terrific and she shouted back, God a mercy, good people. <laughs> Elizabeth interpreted her religious role in a new way. She declared that she didn't mind whether her subjects were Catholic or Protestant, so long as they were loyal. She'd survived by being very careful about what she said and did, and that was how she coped with sovereignty. She dared not marry or be touched by scandal, but her every move was watched like any modern royal, maybe more so. To the extent that her laundresses were bribed by ambassadors who wanted to know whether her periods had stopped in case she was pregnant. She made herself look splendid, held magnificent pageants, and eventually seemed to be holding the kingdom together without the rebellions, persecutions, and massacres that had become regular features of English life. She managed this in partnership with an immensely loyal and capable minister, William Cecil, and constantly teasing the world with a showy flirtation with the Earl of Leicester, Robert Dudley. But the love affair she really encouraged was to have the nation adore her. In poetry, paintings and theatre, she was Gloriana, the magical beauty to whom loyalty and love were equally due and who had no lover or husband to distract her gaze. The main threat facing her was the possibility of a Catholic plot to replace her with one of the grandchildren of Henry VIII's sister Margaret, either Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, or Henry Stuart, the Earl of Darnley. 
Both of them had a valid claim, as not only was Elizabeth excommunicated, she was arguably illegitimate. They were carefully encouraged to maneuver themselves into helplessness. Mary was the more dangerous. She'd been Queen of France until her husband's death, and a ruler of Scotland who had French backing would be a danger to England even without the religious issue. But Mary's education had been unlike Elizabeth's. She'd not lived in fear of her life, but in the indulgent French court. This was not a good preparation for life in Britain, a land of conspiracies and killings. Darnley was a weak man in a weak position, a good-looking, unstable lout. What happened next looks like a cunning plan. Elizabeth pretty much obliged the 19-year-old Darnley to visit the 22-year-old widow Mary, having ordered him not to marry her. The result was totally predictable. And Darnley was a total liability to Mary. Dim-witted and resentful of his lack of power, he was also furiously jealous. And when he thought her advisor Rizzio was having an affair with Mary, he joined a plot that had Rizzio murdered in front of her. She now viewed Darnley, the patsy in all this, with hatred and contempt, and was herself complicit in the plot that murdered him with an explosion. She ended up fleeing her own kingdom and throwing herself on Elizabeth's mercy, ultimately a bad place to be. Elizabeth was half the time sure that Mary should be executed to deprive Catholic plotters of a candidate for the throne, and half the time sure that she should do no such thing. Ruling queens were rarer than hen's teeth, for one to kill another really wasn't good. She signed the death warrant, but in a state of real distress. Mary and Darnley had a son, James, and he was now the virtually incontrovertible heir to Elizabeth's throne. She wrote to him confirming that and apologising for what she'd done to his mother. The very idea that it was legitimate to kill a crown sovereign was extremely dangerous. Elizabeth was deeply concerned with the rights and powers, the prerogatives of the sovereign. She was very wary of Parliament, which in her view treated every request for taxes as a blackmail opportunity to give itself powers of government. So she tried very hard not to ask for taxes, and her government was parsimonious, mean as possible and then some. She was determined to protect royal authority. She refused to allow Parliament to refer to England as a state. She said it sounded too much like something to do with the States General, the parliamentary body that ruled the Dutch Republic. That Republic, born out of a rebellion against the King of Spain, was in Elizabeth's eyes an unfortunate novelty. It was her ally in her struggle to keep England out of Spain's clutches, but she was nervous that its political ideas might be catching. England was a kingdom. It happened to be ruled by a queen, but as she famously said, one who had the heart and stomach of a king. Of course, Elizabeth's greatest moment was when she managed to see off the Spanish Armada, when Philip II, by far the most powerful ruler in the world, assembled a vast fleet to collect an invasion army from the Low Countries and bring England back into the Roman Catholic Church. The English fleet, genuinely patriotic, genuinely daring, skillfully harried the Armada to prevent it finding a safe anchorage where it could make contact with the landing force. When the Spanish decided to sail home, they were hit by strong winds and heavy seas that were too much for many of these Mediterranean cargo vessels. So far as the English and the Dutch were concerned, God had blown them away. Philip himself saw it as a baffling defeat that meant God was not on his side. But Elizabeth was still not prepared to ask Parliament for the money to pay her victorious sailors' wages. They were not due to be paid until they came ashore, so their queen left them rotting at anchor. And when messengers came to court to plead for the starving men who'd saved England, they arrived in the middle of extravagant celebrations of the victory and were turned away. Elizabeth died, the grandest of all England's rulers, in 1603. Her successor was Mary's son, James Stuart, already ruler of Scotland. He had inherited glory. 
but with it an empty treasury and an isolated kingdom.